two rounds, three rounds, or four rounds, whatever, then we'll be able to uh, do that. So um, I just wanted to sort of make that known to all the committee members here. Uh, we all sense that the current recession is different from any we have known in our lifetime. Too many senior citizens who have worked hard their whole lives now must confront the sad reality that their entire life savings has been wiped out. I can see it in the eyes of my neighbors in Brooklyn worried about whether they will have a job next month or not. And yet we have relatively little understanding about what really caused this crisis. What we do know is that our financial regulatory system has failed the American people. Dangerous and unacceptable levels of risk were allowed to build up in our financial system leading to the catastrophic failure of our nation's economy. But exactly why this happened and who was responsible remains unclear. It is also unclear what is really happening to the billions of dollars of taxpayers' money that is being used to prop up these businesses. We see midnight negotiations taking place behind closed doors with few details released about how decisions were made and why. When questions are asked, the answers coming back is mostly just trust us, trust us, just wait, trust us. The American people deserve clear answers to how and why this failure occurred. Why, who was responsible and who benefited? Why the existing regulatory system failed? And what steps need to be taken going forward in this regard? I believe that a comprehensive review of the rise and fall of AIG and the involvement of counterparties like Goldman Sachs can provide a useful vehicle to understanding how inadequate regulations, cheap money, risky business deals, and in some instances, corruption led to the current economic crisis. Today's hearing is the first in a series of hearings this committee will con conduct as part of our investigation of AIG. We plan to hold additional hearings on AIG in April and May. It is too soon to announce the witnesses, and we'll do that at a later date. But this will be a comprehensive review of the AIG problem. We have decided to focus on AIG because it is the largest single recipient of federal bailout money, $180 billion so far. In addition, AIG was at the center of the whirlwind as the financial services sector began to crumble. AIG was the largest insurance company in the United States and one of the largest companies in the world. It, is, it, it had operations in virtually every corner of our financial world, and therefore we believe it will serve as an excellent illustration of what went wrong and what we need to change and to correct. Of particular interest are the complex operations of AIG's financial products. The overly imaginative an ambitious division of AIG that sold billions of dollars worth of credit default swaps on over-the-counter derivatives market, all of which are largely exempt from federal regulation. Hopefully, Mr. Greenberg will be able to sh shed some light on whether this was a well-managed division of AIG or whether it was a poorly managed renegade operation. Today, we will hear testimony from the one man who knows more about AIG than anyone in the world, Maurice R. Greenberg, who serves as Chief Executive Officer of AIG for over 35 years. Later in April, we ho will hold another hearing and Edward M. Liddy, the current CEO of AIG, will have an opportunity to testify about current activities at AIG. I understand that Mr. Greenberg and Mr. Liddy may have differing views about AIG and the federal bailout of the company. I think that's what we might hear today. We also know that there are lawsuits and other probes associated with the activities of AIG. 
While the committee intends to conduct oversight of these and other sensitive matters regarding the IG, it is not the purpose of this hearing to intervene in any ongoing litigation. The purpose of this hearing is to probe Mr. Greenberg about AIG and its operations and obtain a new perspective on what went wrong, how to fix it, and what should be done to prevent similar disasters in the future. A word of caution, there has been a lot of talk about how to reform regulation of the financial services industry. I would urge my colleagues on this committee and elsewhere not to move too quickly to reform the financial sector without first fully understanding what caused this financial meltdown. That being said, I look forward to a thorough examination of AIG, and I want to thank our witness today, Mr. Greenberg, for appearing here. Thank you very much. And this time I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, the time that we're being given to look at the financial crisis from the very beginning. As I have said in, in a letter to you and uh, will continue to say, I'm troubled that today we only have one witness, and this witness brings a cloud of some uh, suspicion uh, based on allegations that have been made against him. Notwithstanding that, the assurances that we will complete the entire picture of AIG from start today to finish I think is critical and we are the only committee that has shown an interest in delving that deeply into this crisis from before it began until today and as the chairman said in his opening remarks intend to go beyond to make sure it doesn't happen again. The witness before today, today is a recurring figure in both criminal and civil investigations by the Department of Justice and the Security Exchange Commission. The U.S. Attorney has identified Mr. Greenberg as a co-conspirator in a criminal securities fraud case that has already resulted in five convictions. News reports, whether fair or unfair, indicate the SEC action against Mr. Greens Greenberg on these security fraud charges could come any day and there are good reasons to believe that he could face even more significant legal challenges. Mr. Greenberg, uh, I say that because I believe that we have to set the record straight. I don't do so uh, in order to assume that those charges are true. That's for others to decide. Moving forward, I'm confident that this committee will have Edward Liddy and a number of other key people involved both in the operation of AIG before and, and or sorry, during the intervening period from the time you left until today. I also believe the committee, many times not in hearings, but in other ways, is going to have to evaluate in depth a number of actions by this administration and its predecessor. As CEO of AIG, it is clear that for the first 35 years, you built a company that the world admired. You built market, uh, market capital second to none, the largest in your industry and one of the largest in the world. It is also clear that the crumbling of AIG began on your watch, that there were systemic problems that had occurred. Today, I'm sure that we will hear, and perhaps rightfully so, that those problems, if managed correctly, would not have led to the same outcome as we are facing uh, here today and around the world. As many here know, Mr. Cummings and I both wrote the chairman uh, first in December and then more recently asking for additional uh, investigations. I've received assurances from the chairman that we will have those and I look forward to working in a bipartisan fashion to ensure that this investigation is the most thorough in Congress. It is very clear that we will also hear today that TARP funds have been used in a less efficient fashion than they should have been under both the previous administration and the current administration, meaning that rather than using assurances or other instruments that cost little or nothing, we've delivered cold hard cash in many cases outside the United States. It has been widely reported the, uh, uh, the millions of dollars paid in bonuses to AIG executives who were retained as part of a contract 
and Congress has attempted to claw back those dollars through a number of mechanisms. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to asking this witness what he would have done had he been faced with the meltdown and recognizing that the uh, 100,000 plus employees that built this company leave every day and if they do not return, in fact, all the capital of the company has left and not returned. So, Mr. Chairman, I recognize that this is just the beginning of what is going to be a thorough investigation into how and why $180 billion of taxpayers' money so far has been committed to AIG and thus far has not created a stable company. Additionally, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to our, our staffs working on a bipartisan basis, most often behind the scenes, most often not through public hearings, in order to get to the entire truth. I think both you, Mr. Chairman, and myself agree the reason we have so many investigators is that a lot of what we do is not legislation, but in fact investigation. And uh, I look forward to the testimony today and the work beyond and yield back the balance of my time. I would like to thank the gentleman from California, and I do look forward to working with you. Uh, it is a long-standing tradition, Mr. Greenberg, that we swear in all of our witnesses. Please write it. Stand and raise your right hand. And is the council going to answer any questions? If the council is going to answer any questions, you should also be sworn in. Just in case. Yeah. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that both answered in the affirmative. Mr. Maurice R. Greenberg former Chief Executive Officer of AIG, has been an outspoken critic of AIG's bailout, having presided over the company for nearly four decades. Mr. Greenberg is uniquely qualified to help explain what went wrong at AIG and how best to fix it. Given the complexity of the issue, we invited Mr. Greenberg to extend his oral remarks beyond the usual five-minute summary. We will give you extra time. Following his testimony, we will entertain questions from all of the members. Of course, at this time, Mr. Greenberg, you may begin. The mic on there. Push the button. There we go. Is that on? Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, good morning. I am the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of C.V. Star & Company and the former Chairman and Chief Executive of AIG. I thank you for extending me an invitation to appear before you today. I regret that the last time you invited me to testify, I was dealing with a bout of pneumonia, so I appreciate this opportunity to present my thoughts and answer any questions you may have. I want to address at the outset two questions. First, some say that I've, been go I've gone from, from the company for four years, so what can I know? Second, I hear that AIG has been telling everyone who will listen that we are engaged in a lot of litigation. The fact is, I'm still AIG's largest individual shareholder. I care about the company I built, and I care very much about AIG's employees and investors who have been badly hurt. As AIG's largest shareholder, I have kept up to date on what the company is doing. The litigation that has been pending for four years will be resolved in the courts. It involves matters that date back many years, and in some cases many decades, and which in any event have nothing to do with the enormous problems that AIG has encountered in recent years under my successors. The, um, uh, the question that was raised by Mr. Issa uh, about so-called indictment was a threat by Elliot Spitzer uh, when he was Attorney General, and he subsequently dropped that uh, charge over a Thanksgiving weekend. AIG's history demonstrates that its business can be highly successful if properly managed and managed properly. AIG is the only way to ensure that the American taxpayer will be repaid. 
AIG is deeply diversified, has a deeply diversified earnings base. That was no accident. It was a conscious part of our approach to risk management when I and like-minded people managed AIG. We diversified in the insurance industry, both domestic and internationally, and within the insurance business, life and non-life. We were, we were very creative in innovating new products. And then began finance operations to further diversify AIG's earnings base. That led to the creation of AIG FP in 1987. We were then a AAA rated company. From 1987 to 2004, my last full year at AIG, AIG contributed over $5 billion in dollars in AIG's pre-tax income, was subject to numerous risk controls by AIG senior management. Could you pull the mic just a little closer? We're having trouble hearing you. Sure. Is that better? Thank you. Let me just repeat, from 1987 to 2004, my last full year at AIG, AIG Financial Products contributed over $5 billion in AIG's pre-tax income, was subject to numerous risk controls by AIG senior management, and conducted its business largely on a hedged basis. Massive losses at AIG FP in 2007 and 2008 resulted significantly from a shift in the way the unit did business after I left the company in the spring of 2004. Here's what happened. AIG continued to write credit default protection after the loss of its AAA rating. Uh, two, not only did AIG continue doing so, but it massively increased the risk that it took on, reportedly writing more business in the nine months after I left than in the previous seven years. AIG changed the nature of the business from one focused initially on providing regulatory capital for foreign banks to one focused increasingly on subprime loans. AIG decided not to hedge its risk even after indexes that would have permitted such hedging were available. And even after AIG concluded internally that the business was too risky to continue to write new contracts, and after I left the management, after I left the management controls that I had in place to limit risk were reportedly weakened or eliminated. What are the problems with AIG bailout? I share your concern and the concern of the American people that the terms of the AIG bailout and its tremendous burden on taxpayers all plans so far advanced by the U.S. government to date have failed, and the current plan, in my opinion, will not succeed. Major mistakes have been made. Imposed, the government imposed unrealistic financing terms on AIG in September of 2008, including approximately 14% interest in year one charging interest whether AIG actually drew down funds or not. Uh, that was not only different from those that were imposed on any other company, but which fundamentally undermined AIG's continued viability. The government also um, obtained 79.9% of the equity in the company. They immediately announced that AIG would be liquidated which inevitably caused employees, brokers, customers, and other business partners to flee, further undermining the company's continued viability. They began to liquidate the company at fire sale prices in the market, which obviously uh, credit was difficult to obtain um, and it was difficult to sell anything. They used AIG to funnel money to other institutions, including foreign banks, AIG was required to put up collateral as, uh, after losing their AAA rating. They advanced billions of dollars of taxpayer money to, at AIG instead of pursuing the opportunity to raise private capital in conjunction with providing government guarantees 
that would have eliminated the necessity of putting up additional cash collateral. There's a better approach. What should the government's policy be with regard to AIG? The primary objective should be to create con conditions that allow AIG to repay the taxpayer, of course, and rebuilding AIG is the best way of doing that. Specifically, what should be done is to achieve this, to achieve this goal of AIG to pay back the taxpayer. One, wall off AIG financial products from the rest of the company and replace as many loans as possible with guarantees. Extend the existing, the, what, what remains of existing loans for 20 years at possible inter interest rates of, of, of 5%. That seems to be the TARP interest rate. Reduce the government's ownership to 15% common equity to allow private capital to be raised over time. At a later date if necessary and proper conditions exist, non-core assets could be sold. The current approach of announcing the sale of insurance subsidiaries simply results in people seeking employment elsewhere and taking business with them. A new senior management team of internationalists with skilled insurance capabilities should be recruited. Insurance experience in the lines of business that AIG is engaged in. They must be quick learners to understand AIG's business and culture. You don't buy loyalty, but rather create it through strong but fair leadership. You must have the respect of your employees and the market. There should not be an on-the-job training experience. AIG's business model did not fail, its management did. AIG's business model has a long track record of success over many decades. AIG can recover from its immediate crisis, continue to be an employer of tens of thousands of hardworking Americans, and repay the assistance that it's received from the American taxpayer. But only if both the government and AIG's management change their approach in dealing with its future. It seems to me that um, the role of government should be uh, to get a company that's in need of health back on its feet as soon as possible so it can become a taxpayer again and an employer. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Greenberg, for your uh, statement. Uh, let me begin uh, at, uh, by saying Who's responsible for the fall of AIG, and what did they specifically do or did not do that caused the failure? Who's responsible? Well, clearly, the successor management has to be uh, has to be charged with that. Let me go back uh, and explain uh, the creation of AIG financial products for a moment, uh, so you can put that in and better a, a focus. Uh, as, I, as I indicated, Senator Ribikoff, uh, when he was alive, obviously, called, said I ought to meet a young man, uh, which we did, um, and uh, his name was Sosin. Uh, he was, uh, and he began AIG Financial Products. Uh, he, was a, he was very bright and brought a very good team of, of a PhD uh, type of people uh, with him, um, and did principally interest rate swaps. Um, it was not a very complex business, uh, but the AAA rating of AIG uh, made it a, a very efficient business. As I said earlier, um, it produced from 87 till I left about five billion in profits. We had a disagreement with Sosin about a year and a half into the uh, uh, into the relationship, and uh, we and we terminated, and he he left, went elsewhere, and a man by the name of Tom Savage, a uh, very bright Ph.D., became its manager, and business went along quite well. It really was a um, an informal kind of joint venture. Seventy percent of the profits were part, were for AIG, and thirty percent went to AIGFP, but of the 30%, half of it 
had to remain in the company, in, F, in FP, in their capital account, subject to the same risk that AIG took. In other words, they had their own money in the company as part of the risk capital that, uh, that we had. Uh, so there was a, that was another form of risk management on top of the risk management controls that we had. We were the first company, as far as I know, in the insurance industry to have an enterprise uh, risk management uh, department that covered all areas of AIG globally to ensure that we didn't have concentration in any single area of business. It was very effective. Uh, AIG Financial Products could not do a new product without having it climbed over by a number of different areas to ensure that it met our standards. It, it functioned quite well. Uh, and um, as I said, when we left the company, there were three of us who left simultaneously. Uh, that was fairly important people, myself, uh, the chief financial officer, and the head of investments. Um, my successor obviously did not pay as much attention uh, to what he should have paid uh, attention to. I think the new chairman uh, who succeeded me uh, must have paid very little attention to it as well. Uh, and as a result, they went off on a tangent and wrote uh, in nine months more than double the amount of business that we had put on in financial products um, than uh, we did in the past seven, seven years. Um, and of a lower quality business. All of that's been, been verified. Uh, and so, you know, clearly, um, if you don't have controls and you don't have management oversight, uh, things could go wrong, and they did. Well, you know, we, we, our purpose, Mr. Greenberg, is to try to get to the bottom of this. You know, the American people are angry over uh, what so happened. So am I. Here. Yeah. And, it, and of course, uh, we need to take a look to see in terms of what we need to do here in the Congress in terms of we look at the regulatory agents. And we're trying to find out exactly what went wrong. Let me just ask this. It looks to me as though much of what went wrong at AIG was centered on the financial products unit, AIGFP. Uh, after you left, did AIGFP become a renegade operation? Well, I wouldn't know if it call it renegade. I think they got greedy. I think they wrote uh, considerably more business than they should have. I think they should have hedged. When they, when they lost the AAA rating after I left the company, that should have been a signal uh, to discontinue writing credit default swaps and hedge the book because by their own admission in their 10K filings, they said that they would be required to put up more collateral. So they knew that. They disclosed that. And having done that, you would have thought that, that somebody, whether the president, CEO, or the chairman, should have called a halt and said, until, until we regain a AAA rating, uh, we're either going to slow down materially or discontinue. Because if you have to put up more collateral, you got a problem. AIG did not have a solvency problem. It had a liquidity problem. Right. On that note, on that note, I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one quick question, because many of us are not all as sophisticated. Right now, an A rating would be better than the state of California's bond rating, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know what the rating in California is. It's not you, You're probably a. more familiar with that than I am. <laughs> so uh, an A rating, less than a AAA, is not necessarily bad. You're down to a B rating before you get to be sort of in the junk category. So uh, just for all of us, that downgrade was significant, of course, compared to being sort of blue chip AAA. But the company was still at that point relatively considered to be a well-rated company, not different than GE has been from time to time. Yeah, but the problem is in the credit default swap uh, agreements, uh, you'd be required, once you lost your triple A rating, to, uh, to be required to put up collateral. And so that, 
that became not a question of uh, option. It became a question of right. The call I mean, comes in, and in you 48 hours, you're to, supposed to deliver. Either that, or you have to renegotiate the agreements. Well, to that extent, one of my concerns was that AIGFP had a balance sheet that was roughly 80 billion in assets, 80 billion in liabilities. Uh, that 15 percent accumulated retained earnings didn't seem to be on the books, and my folks tell me that a normal capital ratio would have meant there would have been at least 6.4 billion on the books. Was that part of the problem? Is that the the FP portion of those accumulated earnings was a not there and b too small? You said that there was five billion of accumulated earnings. If I were to take uh, half of 30 percent of that, it doesn't add up to a lot of money. So, so on 80 billion worth of of outstanding obligations. You never, FP never really got to any kind, without AIG parent, it never got to any kind of real base of, of, uh, of collateral. Uh, uh, Ms. Deesa, what I've said is that 50% of the current earnings of their, their share went into FP. It came out at the other end by 20% a year. In other words, after five years, they can began to dribble out as new earnings came in. Now, I don't have the numbers in front of me as to. Uh, how much was accumulated, but that's the way it worked. Sure, they now, may have they may and, have changed that when I left. I don't know. Right, but just using your opening statement on five billion dollars worth of earnings during that period of time, you take thirty percent of five billion, their share, take half of it and distribute it. You know, basically, you got a billion dollars. No, five billion was what AIG shares was. Uh, what AIG parent share yes. was. Okay, so it would have been. So it would have been about a billion and a half. Billion and a half. So still a relatively small amount of money if the portfolio was 80 billion that they had essentially as real skin in the game. Yeah, well, they didn't come with a lot of, with, with a lot of skin. They came with intellectual, the, the idea was they had intellectual capital, um, and if it was properly managed, and if you had the right risk controls in, which we did. Uh, it worked fine. So it's fair to say that from inception through when they had a billion and a half skin in the game, you always were relying on AIG's money, not FP's money, because the growth was far too quick to ever actually have the retained earnings for it to be primarily their capital first. Is that right? I realize you shared it, but, but they started off at zero. So for an insurance company, starting off at zero and a uh, a triple-A rating is kind of a good deal, isn't it? Yeah, but remember, uh, we had about 71 billion of retained earnings in AIG uh, that has accumulated over the years, and it was a good way to use it. Sure. Uh, no. we, thought that was, we thought that was a, an excellent way. Our triple-A rating was capital, yeah. and uh, it had to be preserved. No, I agree. Uh, I want to just set the record straight on one thing, because when in the opening statement, and I told you earlier it, it had to be tough, and, and I think it was, I was referring to uh, the United States versus Ferguson. This is a Connecticut-based case, which I show is still ongoing, and that you've recently received a Wells notice. Uh, your counsel may be able to advise you, but that, that case hasn't been dismissed. Is that correct? The, the which? This is uh, U United States versus Ferguson. It's, in, it's the Connecticut case? Um, uh, the uh, Wells notice uh, did not come in that case. The Wells notice is a notice that is issued by the SEC. It has nothing to do with that case. Okay, I show them as, as, um, the, as a related the, transaction, but you do have a Wells notice, and the United States versus Ferguson et al. is still a current case. Is that right? Uh, it, it, I, I, it is a case that has been tried. Um, and it is now on appeal, but that is not a case to which Mr. Greenberg is or ever has been a party or where anybody has tried to add him as a party defendant. Okay, well, and I apologize because our information from uh, uh, the district in Connecticut shows that, uh, uh, that Mr. Greenberg is, a, is seen as an unindicted co-conspirator. And, and, and I, and I, and I, and I, I want to right. say, look, we're not trying to right. make a case here right. because I just want to make, make right. it clear that there's, there's an awful lot of unwinding of right. these things still going on. And is it fair right. to say that? Well, it, it, it's fair to say it's unindicted. And unindicted means you're not named a party. By unindicted, it means he's not a party to the litigation. 
Right, and I didn't mean to end on that note. I just wanted to set the record straight. Thank you, right. Mr. Chairman. Right, okay, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, gentleman from Maryland, Congressman Cummings. Mr. Chairman, I, too, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, bringing this hearing to us. Mr. Greenberg, um, you were very clear in your written testimony as you've been in the past public statements that the problems that led to the downfall of AIG were not of your making. Uh, let me quote a line from your testimony. Quote, let me be clear, AIG's business model did not fail, its management did. And I think you, end of quote, and I think you said something very similar to that at least twice already this morning. Um, when you refer to management, are you uh, including yourself in that category? No, how can I? I'm not in the company. And so, I haven't been in the company. So you don't, you don't, so you don't see your role in the company as being a part of its failure. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you, you don't. Mr. Mr. Cummins, uh, when I left the company, it was a healthy company. It, it, its market cap was $170 billion. Uh, its earnings were strong. Um, uh, it, um, it, its share price was $64 a share. Uh, we had no problems. We had good risk management to okay. control the company. I got you. Um, and I'm convinced that the systemic problems at AIG go far deeper than the mistakes made in the four years since you left the company. You note in your written testimony that AIG suffered greatly as a result of losing its triple A rating. I think you just were talking about that a moment ago, uh, which occurred, by the way, immediately after you resigned. What you do not mention, however, is that the company lost that rating as a result of the failures that occurred on your watch. You stepped down on March 14, 2005, and Fitch Rating Service downgraded AIG's credit rating to double A the next day. Do you accept any responsibility at all for the events leading up to the, uh, that critical moment? No, I don't, because what was done uh, there was a restatement uh, that was, um, that was um, made by AIG. Most of the items in the restatement have since uh, been proven to be improper or unnecessary and had nothing to do with me, whatever. Well, I think you had a significant role to play, particularly with regards to the problems with the Financial Products Division that has been largely blamed for the downfall of AIG. You note in your written testimony, and I quote, AIG Financial Products reportedly wrote as many credit default swaps on collateralized debt obligations or CDOs in the nine months following my departure as it had written in the entire previous seven years, end of quote. And I think you said that again today. Yes, and that's correct. Clearly that practice was problematic and it ultimately led to the, to the company's downfall. But what you fail to mention is that a good portion of those risky bets occurred while you were still at the helm of AIG. By the time the firm stopped writing swaps for CDOs that included some subprime, subprime mortgages, it had nearly $80 billion of these products in its portfolio. How many of those swaps were issued under your leadership? Uh, first of all, Mr. C uh, Mr. Cummings, as far as I know, there are no losses, whatever, on the, on the credit default swap. That was, uh, that was reported to the Senate Banking Committee last month by the head of the Thrift Administration. It wasn't losses that brought AIG down, AIG financial products. It was a lack of collateral that they had to put up. And the reason they needed more collateral was because they lost their AAA rating. So how many of those swaps occurred under your leadership? I can't give you the answer sitting here right now, but whatever would you say? Problem, would you say but, seven but billion? May I finish? Yeah, I want you to finish, but I want you to give me a straight answer. Well, I'm trying to, if you let me finish. All right, I'm listening. Uh, the the uh, amount that we wrote uh, was for European banks, uh, their regulatory capital needs. As far as I know, there was never a loss on any of that, um, number one. Number two, because we were AAA rated, we did not have to put up collateral. 
so when AIG lost their AAA rating and they, and they uh, wrote as much in nine months as we wrote in seven years um, at a lower, lower quality business with multi-sector CDOs, that became a different book of business. I see my time has run out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate it. And, and thank you, Mr. Greenberg, for being here. Uh, my understanding is when you were AIG CEO, you also sat atop Star International Company, or the acronym SICO, SICO. You are still the CEO of SICO. Is that correct? That's correct. And before AIG's collapse, did uh, SICO control about $20 billion of AIG stock? It was the largest, yeah, it was the largest shareholder. What was the purpose of this organization? Well, that organization predated AIG. Uh, in fact, it gave birth uh, to AIG. It owned a lot of the assets that ultimately became uh, AIG. And when it did so, it got AIG stock in return for the assets that it contributed. Now, it, part, of the, uh, part of the purpose here of that organization is to provide long-term deferred compensation for current and future generations of AIG employees, correct? No, I think that um, that is uh, that's a statement that's uh, quite uh, quite a bit exaggerated. One of the purposes um, of um, of Seco Star International. Seco. Yeah. I'll pronounce it that way. Okay, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, was that the voting shareholders every two years? First of all, it was owned by a charitable trust. Seco is owned, the actual owner is a charitable trust. And, and my understanding is you're the trustee of those assets, correct? No, no. Were you no. not the trustee for these assets? No. no you were charitable, not. There's a charitable trust. I'm sorry, what? There's a charitable trust. But let me finish um, because um, uh, that's a misunderstanding that has been uh, and there's litigation on that in now, the courts. Let me let me uh, just let me jump in there. You're currently being sued by AIG to recoup an estimated four billion dollars in assets that AIG alleges you misappropriated from Star International Company, Seco. Is well, that right? I think that's that's there's litigation, but that's it, totally incorrect. Th that would be what? It's totally incorrect. Um, huh? You want you want to answer that? Go ahead. There is litigation right now that is pending um, uh, in federal court that's going to go to trial on June 15th of this year. Now, um, it, it was a charitable trust, correct? There is a charitable trust that is the owner of all the common stock, non-voting common stock, of it, Star International. And, and my and understanding is that organization over the last 30 years <laughs> has only donated 0.005% of its worth to charity. Is that correct? No, I think that probably what you're doing is you're taking that information from what AIG has been dissemin disseminating. Um, I think that. Um, I, I just wonder if it's true or not. Yeah, I, I, I think your answer. I, I think the information that you have is not accurate. I don't think it, it takes into account. Uh, I mean, for example, it could not possibly take into account the um, the contributions that have been made since the DCPP uh, plans uh, were, uh, were were terminated. Uh, I, th I, think, I, think, I think your numbers probably are simply outdated. Is it going to be what? Are simply outdated. Uh, it, let, let me ask you, Mr. Greenberg, did you turn uh, SECO into your own personal investment vehicle? Uh, I, I just don't understand where the shares are today. No, it's not my personal uh, investment vehicle. I am chairman. I am one of 10 voting shareholders, and I'm a director. Where, where are the shares now today? The shares are worth a lot less than they were through no fault where, of where are the shares though the shares are in a i presume the shares are in a in um, either in a custody account or or in a vault and did you in, did you invest them in a vault they're not all invested at home? they're not all invested uh, uh, sir they're not all invested some of them are are, uh, uh, are just not invested they have made some investments but uh, but not all of them have been invested. But do you know and where all the... And it's been invested to, to uh, ultimately, I hope we invest it all. I would hope that some of AIG's value returns, uh, which is what we 
which is what it was originally. Uh, it started out at $20 billion. It's down probably to a, maybe a couple of billion dollars now through no fault of, of SECO. It, it, would you be willing to give this money back to go back to the taxpayers? What money? The Why money would it go back to the taxpayer? The, the what? Why would it go back to the taxpayer? Well, the tax because of what's going on. The reason we're having this whole hearing here. Well, you can go out in the street and start collecting from them. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, this has no connection I, I, with that. I, I, I'm not understanding that whatsoever. Here, here you have a charitable uh, organization that has really not been a charitable organization, as best I can tell, yeah. and that the shares are in somehow in some vault. But I appreciate your time and your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Well, Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Let me just announce to the committee, we have votes on the floor, and we are going to recess for one hour, and we will be back in one hour. We have, I think, five or six votes on the floor. Early lunch, long day. <laughs> Shame on you, sir. I hope the...